thank you all so much for coming. my name is lindsay deaver. i'm the assistant director of institutional research here at bryn mawr college and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's talk. um we are at the assessment and blended learning presentations. hopefully you're in the right place. check your programs. and the presentations this afternoon will offer three perspectives based on how we might optimize assessment tools and tactics for blended learning initiatives from the classroom level all the way up to the institutional level and we have three fabulous speakers today. um first we'll be hearing from luke phelan I'm going to try to pronounce their names all correctly, we'll see. Um, Luke is from the student, he is the student learning assessment specialist for the blended learning initiative at the Five College Consortium. And today he'll be talking with us about how to engage with faculty members at various stages of course design and execution. After Luke, we'll be hearing from Cara Biasucci. Um, Cara is from the University of Texas at Austin. She's the project director and series producer of Ethics Unwrapped. And today she'll be talking with us about an interactive um, discussion to talk with faculty and staff, those seeking to develop or advance ethics education in their undergraduate liberal arts program. And finally, we will hear from Erin. Erin Swoboda is the assistant and assistant professor of environmental studies and economics at Carleton College. And today he will explore some of the effects of emphasizing active learning pedagogies in an introductory microeconomics course. So we will be um, going through each of the presentations um, one right after the other, and we'll be holding all questions until the end. I'm gonna try to keep them to time so that we have about 15 minutes at the end for any questions that you may have. So if you can, please hold all questions till the very end. All right, thank you so much. Welcome, Luke. Okay, thanks, Lindsay. Um, is this, yes? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so, hi, everyone. Uh, I am Luke Fallon. I'm the Student Learning Assessment Specialist. We're going to go from the bottom of the slide up for the <laughs> Blended Learning Initiative at five colleges. Um, and what uh, I wanted to talk to you guys about today is a quick overview here um some background on five colleges so you know sort of where we're coming from where the blended learning initiative sits within that um and then moving pretty quickly into a sort of general talk about lessons learned um over the past year of projects and project cycles um and really sort of more reflective and a little bit of audience participation oh boy um and then we'll pivot into sort of two case studies of what uh happened in two different courses so about the five colleges, um, the five colleges are uh, Smith, Amherst, Mount Holyoke, the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, and Hampshire College, and the five college consortium rules them all. <laughs> <laughs> Unapproved usage of the logo. <laughs> um, the mission of five colleges is uh, to promote and administer long-term forms of cooperation, um, so we have a lot of shared educational and cultural resources, including a shared library system, departments and programs, inter-campus transportation. So it's logistical and it also tries to we try to do some visioning and convening work around that kind of thing. The Five College Blended Learning Initiative, I think, sits very nicely in with this mission and, and the general work of the consortium. So we are particularly interested in encouraging cross-campus collaborations and courses um, with an emphasis uh, in our initiative on humanities and humanistic social science. Um, in the first year of the grant, we had six projects. Um, this past academic year, 10 projects, two of which were multi-campus, um, meaning that faculty and support staff from multiple campuses were contributing to a course. And for our coming year, we have nine projects, although that should sort of have an asterisk on it, because some complicated special, ch special children. Um, and four of those are gonna be significantly multi-campus. And I should also say that Courses that aren't officially multi-campus, say if the course is taught at Smith, it will pull students from other institutions. Um, we have a great deal of cross-reg that we're very proud of and always trying to build on. Um, in terms of the blended initiatives reach, um, courses have run on all five of the campuses and we've hit a lot of the departments, uh, you know, emphasis on the and more, and apologies to the languages. <laughs> um, but the scope has been very wide, so we're, we're pretty pleased. So lesson number one, uh, what we've come to call the A word. Um, I don't know if this is news to how many of you, assessment has a terrible image. Um, it provokes a lot of anxiety in a lot of different people for a lot of different reasons. Um, and if you'll excuse just a minor hyperbole, 
uh, people, by which I mean faculty, because they are people too, uh, report feelings of being judged by depthless corporatrons. Um, that's a summary and a slight exaggeration, but I do, in my conversations with um, faculty and instructors, that sort of lingering sense is behind all of that. So the word assessment is sometimes, I think, a distraction, just the word itself, because it interrupts this bigger conversation that we need to have and want to have, which is how do we get to the learning? Um, so, as promised with audience participation, please turn to whoever you are sitting near um, and take a quick minute. Why, why do you think that is or might be? No useful feedback. Unfair yep. feedback. Need to talk to my colleagues. <laughs> good. So we have a good sense of why. Yeah. Um, I think the concerns I hear a lot is what is this actually capturing, right? Is it the rich, detailed, granular presentation of my amazing teaching that I know that I do? Um, and how will it be used? Uh, which I think no one knows. Shout it out, but I really do. It yeah, sits no, behind a lot of this. Is this assessment going to live on? What tenure file is it going to show up in? Um, questions like that. Okay. So trying to build on that from as a lesson learned, thinking about rebranding for the coming ad academic year. We've got some contenders. This is going to be the shout out portion in a second. <laughs> for rebranding assessment, uh, we've heard understanding outcomes. It's nice. It's neutral. A little bland. Yeah, a little bland. Um, engagement, which is something I talked about a lot already. Uh, learning, another one that I push hard in my job title, um, and you know it's hard to be against. Uh, similarly, <laughs> critical thinking. The next one is shouted out. If you work with me or with your idea, or you've heard me say it, don't give away my big reveal at the end. Your answer: rebranding, assessment, new terms. Evidence of learning. Evidence of learning. Good. That's it. I'm gonna blow your mind. <laughs> continuous improvement. Instructor, instructor satisfaction. Continuous improvement is a good one too, because we want to continuously improve structure instructor satisfaction. So this is something we're really just now starting to talk about at past colleges, and really all praise for this phrase goes to Trey Andrea in the back, who is our new faculty coordinator, and has given a great sort of insight into how instructors are thinking about the word assessment and where we might come to meet them where they live. Um, and I'm. You're going to get to into more of that in just a sec. Um, but what would instructor satisfaction look like? I think it's shifting the question. There we go. What would make this course a success for you, right? So we ask about students and what are students going to learn a lot, but a satisfactory experience for an instructor is maybe going to capture, uh, going to capture some of that student outcome. Um, what needs to happen for you to be happy with the course outcomes uh, as a way to meet people where they are? 
um, and etc. Um, so lesson two, conversation drift. Um, my experience has been that uh, discussions about assessment quickly turn to things that are immediately adjacent and sometimes pretty distant, but it's familiar stuff, right? Course goals, student work, which I like to talk about in terms of process and product, where are students producing, what are the processes they're using to get there, um, instruction, right? What kinds of instruction are you going to deliver and how is that going to relate to the assessment you're going to do? Prior knowledge and skills is one that I think doesn't maybe get talked about enough because we have a lot of thoughts about, and whether they're articulated or not, ideas about what students are bringing into the classroom, what they're already able to do. And sometimes that needs a reality check and sometimes that needs to be sort of built on. So um, we talked about that a lot. And then alignment, right, is the big one of trying to get all this stuff to work together. Um, and versa visa, because um, also building on the left bit, what I like to call lesson three, the good opportunism. Opportunism has such a bad name. Um, there are so many different possible sites for engagement around these big issues, assessment, and our various rebrandings. Um, and you can't separate the components, right, because the conversation slides around and we start off talking about the course goal and we wind up on what do we think students are coming in with. Um, so another real quick minute, when is the best time to engage uh, with instructors, faculty around these questions? shake your fast minute sign at you, go, turn to your neighbor. <laughs> um, so lesson four, maybe, and this one is really uh, sort of a reflective place of where I'm at. Um, does assessment come after success? Um, well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're, like, all right, I have some support in the audience. Um, and where this is coming up for us, I think, is particularly around effectiveness. Um, so we talk a lot about assessment in terms of in a course, right? What are students learning? How are students learning? And then we get to the question, how can we improve it? And that has a comparative aspect. Um, and that's when we get into sort of the effectiveness. How do we know that we're being effective? Uh, and it gets into the anxiety issue too, right? What we really want to assess is once we're already firing on all gears and we know that we're, we're killing it. Um, but the other place that this comes in, I think is on a very practical day to day, that the course needs to run. Um, and you know all of the work and, and immediate demands that goes into that can make it easy to sort of push assessment down the road or, or you know, for, and, and sometimes for very practical reasons, it <coughs> does need to sort of take a, a, a second seat. So that's, I mean, that's just a sort of reality check issue. And then the other thing that we see a lot uh, in the blended learning initiative is this question of sort of pilots versus mm -hmm. established practices, right? You need to assess mm -hmm. a pilot initiative very differently. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah, cool. And you need to look at um, established practices you know, with a critical eye, maybe a gimlet eye, uh, it's up to you. Um, but they're, they're, they're different beasts, and it's uh, part of the, I think, anxiety of assessment is that it is a, a very nuanced term that gets applied in a blanket way to, you know, everything in front of it. Okay, so with that in the background, I want to talk about two specific cases, uh, courses that have run in the past year that I was able to opportunistically play a role in. Um, and one was lending a large lecture course, and the other was uh, looking at student learning in a research methods course. So number one, lending a large lecture course. The course was uh, Intro to Comparative Politics at UMass Amherst, and we're going to move quickly. Um, it had two blended components, uh, weekly video lectures and quizzes, and a course blog writing assignment. Um, so I did a survey of students in the course. Um, my opportunity for this was that the instructor was very motivated, really wanted to know what the student experience was. Uh, I went into four different sections and did a survey. Um, it was what I like to call the plus minus delta model, right? What was effective in this course? What was less effective? What suggestions or changes would you recommend? Um, and the format was individual reflection, leading to a small group discussion, and then a whole class report back to try and capture sort of all levels. Very good. Okay, so we're gonna move, just jump right to the Outcomes, the video portion worked very nicely in terms of plus minus delta. Um, students really liked the videos. They said they were helpful for learning. They very much appreciated the conversational tone. I think this reflects stuff that we've seen in a lot of other people's experiences. Production value is not that important to students. They really just like being sort of talked to in a pretty, as though it were a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, they reported it as being interesting, engaging, and well-organized, which is about, I think, the highest grade you can hope for. <laughs> they really like the on-demand aspect of video. This is something that they're saying. Um, they really like that the videos were aligned very closely with the quizzes, uh, and they reported that the quizzes were motivating to watch the videos. So sort of a model, model outcome there. 
Um, not too many negatives. Uh, what they didn't like were the guest lectures, <laughs> um, and that was mostly because of the tone mm. and that the material they thought was too abstract. So they very much liked the professor, and they did not think his guests compared nicely. <laughs> uh, so changes that they suggested: um, more videos, more videos generally, but especially why not treat the guest lectures like other course material and do a video on it? That would be sort of a companion piece and would gloss it and would situate it in the same sort of consistency as other course materials, which I think is an interesting way to think about course design and what students expect and how they sort of interact with stuff that doesn't meet those expectations and doesn't maintain a consistent tone. They asked for a Q&A function, um, and they wanted indexing and segmenting to make it easier to sort of skip around and review, um, and they wanted the inclusion of summary material, um, which uh, stood out and everyone said, huh. <laughs> um, the course blog and writing was a lot more mixed. Um, the students liked the best when it was tied closely to weekly lectures, um, which was a little problematic for the instructor because this was supposed to be a component that would let students explore in depth stuff that was <laughs> tangential or complementary to the main uh, line of lecture. The students thus perceived it to be generally unconnected to the rest of the course, <laughs> having a decreasing relevance over the course of the semester. Okay. Um, the writing and engagement component they reported engaging less with shorter assignments. And this is, wow. I think, a good place to come in and think about what student survey data can really tell us, mm -hmm. right? Because they suggested fewer, more demanding assignments. Mm -hmm. And I think it's fair to ask, if it had been done that way, would we be getting a response of more assignments, but they're shorter? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> they wanted more feedback on their writing, and they were particularly interested in knowing whether or not what their, whether their work was accurate, uh, coherent, uh, relevant to the question they had been posed and whether they had left anything out. Um, so they were looking for, they were expressing interest in fairly detailed feedback, which became an issue in a large lecture course with, uh, you know, a limited quantity of staffing. Um, in terms of engaging with their work by their peers, they generally did not read each other's posts. Uh, when they did, they were trawling for ideas and comparing <laughs> level of effort. Um, they reported wanting more structured interaction. Like, again, this, you know, is it because we asked them that they said that they wanted it? But they, they said that they wanted it, um, and they didn't know what it should look like. So, um, yeah. Hard to know exactly what to do with that. The instructor concluded more video, which we think is a solid conclusion. Um, he was dissatisfied with the capacity uh, to respond to the student work in the way that he wanted to. And so he is scaling back on the blog writing component and considering his options. Um, and now I'll try and plow through the learning research methods uh, course real quick. Um, so this was a course at Smith College. It's the research methods and psychology class. There is a concerted effort in the department to try and improve deep learning and deep learning outcomes. Um, and there was an opportunity to compare methods used in different sections, some sections using a blended learning method, some using a more traditional method. Uh, every section uses the same final exam, um, an essay, uh, which is to write an essay, so student written work, analyze and publish research. Um, and the uh, faculty was very motivated, the uh, projects led by the um, uh, director of the program, so goodbye. Uh, we made an instrument, which is a rubric to assess student writing, key to the critical features. I'm going to plow through this, so if you have questions, uh, hit me up. Um, so very fast, the rubric dimensions were to analyze student work for whether or not these sort of behaviors were present, strongly, weakly, or completely absent proper treatment of evidence, integration of evidence within the studies that they were presented with, integration of evidence across the studies they were presented with, identifying design issues, uh, conclusions and recommendations based on strong deductive reasoning, preference for empirical data, new concepts arising out of either logic that was inherent or bringing in an outside concept, and questioning researcher conclusions. <laughs> I will not try and murder you with the entire rubric, but a quick taste of just one dimension so proper treatment of evidence, <coughs> looking for empirical evidence in both studies is strong, in one or you're a little bit wrong is weak, or nothing at all, and then there's some examples. Uh, come find me if you want more on that. Um, so I'm gonna give you preliminary results real fast and then I'm gonna sit down. Um, but caveats, because this is not my work and they were very generous to share it. Um, deployment is ongoing, data continues to be gathered. This does not include uh, final exams from the last academic year. Fewer blended sections were offered than had been anticipated because that is always the case. Um, and there is a hope and reasonable expectation that there will be a clearer signal with more data. All right, so blended is better. It's evident that the blended method worked better for integration of evidence within studies, uh, less cherry picking among students who did the blended. 
better identification of design flaws, and challenging of obvious conclusions. Uh, and the identification of design flaws was at a statistically significant level in the comparison, the others, uh, Strongbook Rowing, uh, and uh, I have burned my 20 minutes. All right. Um, thank you very much, and next up is... Um,